Okay, cool. So uh, lecture 10, that is the last one on uh, quantification in STEM. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, all of the simulation. So it means we started quantum mechanics all the way forward. We are all we within this uh, lecture series. So we were going through electron energy loss spectroscopy, imaging, image analysis, what do we need to quantify them. We had a few linear machine learning algorithms in there. And uh, before we dive into the more involved machine learning techniques, we are looking here now into uh, image simulation. <clears throat> okay, so let's start. Uh, for this notebook, we really don't need much. Uh, everything is already loaded, so we'll uh, go into the quantum mechanical part of that. And <clears throat> just to remind everybody what's going on, uh, I'm using the uh, beta diffraction theory. Uh, beta developed it in Cornell. Uh, after he came to America. And uh, I'm doing it with the Rux bracket notation. So we have a cat over here and the bra. So you see the angles go in different directions. And there is not really uh, anything very specific there, but it makes it very easy to write. So that's why it is convenient. So the cat is a column vector. We have a row vector. And if we multiply them, right? Then we get a value. If we multiply them the other way around, we have a matrix. So it's just vector algebra. Um, we switch with our notation. Um, sorry, uh, but in order to go back to any kind of quantum mechanics books that you have, um, so now we are looking for two pi over lambda. And uh, this is also important because that is what people are using when they are uh, writing these uh, programs that you're going to use for image simulation. So what do we have here? We have the wavelengths. We have a relativistic corrected mass of the electron. We have a relativistic correction for the energy electron charge, acceleration voltage, speed of light. So that's all we need. We do the general uh, quantum mechanics, so there's nothing special. The, everything goes back to the Schrodinger equation here in the time dependent form, which we're gonna, not going to use. Uh, like for the hydrogen atom, we use the time independent shooting equation. And most of you will have uh, gone through the mathematics of the hydrogen atom. The goal there was to separate the problem in the radial and uh, uh, spherically harmonic part. Here we also try to separate it, uh, but we do that differently because we now have a crystal potential. And that was a, a big contribution of, of beta, right? Uh, a state can be uh, consist of several, uh, of a sum of, of, of uh, waves or, 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 or states, right? So that are going to be the eigenstates and we have eigenvalues, so general stuff. So what we want to do is we want to determine how uh, diffracted beams interact with each other. Uh, and so we are talking about uh, excitation. So we go from one state to the other. The general term for that is with uh, uh, tensor. 
So we have an initial state, a final state, and something that translates them. In our specific case, we have one where we go from the zero beam to a diffracted beam, and we have uh, uh, something that is getting our Bragg's law here uh, uh, introduced. The so states are we are going to use plane waves in the whole thing. And uh, so what we're going to have is our very short expression for our Schrodinger equation. And the Hamiltonian for that is one for the incoming electron, and then another one where we scatter at the potential. And so we separate the two things. So before we are having, before we uh, hit the sample, we are over here. And then once we are in the sample, things are changing. Okay. The Hamiltonian, uh, we can express in different ways. One way is to just change the uh, wave vector. So we go from zero to one of the uh, refracted ones. So we are not using the wave vector stem cells anymore. Now we have the change of them. Um, and we have our crystal potential. And so we have our fully homotonian here. So nothing else but incoming electron and no crystal potential. And we are using, because it's a differential equation, uh, say uh, Schrodinger equation, we use, we like to use uh, exponential functions. So we have a plane wave solution for that. And if we put all of that together now, we come up with uh, kinetic energy, incoming energy, potential energy. This is our crystal, the wave functions. That is our uh, incoming and refracted beams somehow, our break reflections, total energy, and uh, the same ones. The acceleration energy is our electric field potential. So let me put something in here, right? So uh, we have a total energy, which is just this energy here. So this one. Here. Uh, total energy times the uh, charge and the uh, crystal potential is the uh, inside the crystal positive. So we see the attractive force of the uh, of the nuclei of the atoms, but they are shielded by the valence electrons and core electrons of the atoms. So it's a uh, shielded uh, nuclear potential. So, and then we get back to that and uh, put all of that in the, in the Schrodinger equation and we end up with something like this here. So, uh, this part is the total energy part. So this is relatively boring. This one contains the potential. And so this is going to be the interesting part. And the way we generally solve that is uh, with a Bloch wave approach. The Bloch waves is actually, what we do is we just say we have a number of Bragg reflections. They are plane waves. So we go along uh, a reciprocal lattice vector and we sum over all of them, right? And that is our uh, state. No, we don't. Okay, I'm standing in front of it, <laughs> getting a lot of emails here. Uh, anyway, so, uh, so that are the, the Bloch waves and this Bloch waves, Let's look at the zero one uh, to begin with. Uh, this Bloch wave C, say periodic crystal. So it is 
expedient to say the solution for these Bloch waves in the different directions will be periodic. So if it is periodic, then we can uh, use the uh, Bloch function with the, with the uh, plane wave. We can make a Fourier expansion of those. And now we have Fourier coefficients here and another exponential function. So we are using our knowledge that the crystal is periodic uh, and uh, just adapt our, our solutions to that. And the sum goes over all excited beams, electron beams within the crystal and set of our Bragg reflections. And so we have only a few of these allowed Bragg reflections. Uh, we had something like, uh, when we did the diffraction, we had something like yeah. a few hundred of them. So it's not millions and millions of them. So um, this is our function, the crystal potential is uh, in the different uh, periodicity in the different angles, right? And so we have our uh, uh, Fourier components for the crystal potential here. So we have now everything periodic with the crystal symmetry, the potential and our functions. And uh, something we haven't gone into much while we were doing that. So we have an atomic form factor. The atomic form factor is the scattering probability. So what is the probability that when an electron hits it, atom, it gets scattered in a certain uh, angle? Actually, uh, yeah, in a certain angle. So all the rest, so we have a Bohr radius here as well. And so we can uh, express this potential in terms of this um, uh, atomic form factors. And this is very, very similar, as you see, to um, the structure factor that you used from crystallography. So that's where we are going to back. Now we want to solve that. What we do usually is we want to separate out the, the, the problem. Uh, we do the same thing here. Uh, and we are trying to come up with a whole zoo of uh, equations. And we want to have that in matrix form because in matrix form, computer can, can work through that very quickly. So that's what we do. And we are using a relative complicated approximate, uh, abbreviation. So inside the crystal, this electron gets accelerated if it is on the potential. And that, that was what that one ex, uh, expresses here. And over here in this equation, we have uh, just the reflected beam. It's relatively boring, but then we have another uh, term here. And that term is actually the dynamic mixing factor. So, uh, that means that a Bragg reflection, as it goes through the crystal, can steal intensity from other Bragg reflections. We have uh, done that with relativistic correction, so, but it's not really a relativistic uh, equation. So we are not doing crystal field theory or anything like that here. Uh, so this is, say master equation for dynamic diffraction. Uh, and uh, so the mixing terms are the key part here. And that is called dynamic coupling. 
And we'll see in a moment why it is that way. The key thing here is to scale the whole thing a little bit back and go back to the two beam case so that you can see what these different things mean. So the Fourier coefficients and uh, these uh, mixing factors. So where do they uh, come from? If we have a two beam case and that is the basis for the conventional TM, uh, and we also did that two beam condition in uh, convergent beam electron diffraction mode, so in, in STEM mode, so it is uh, the same thing. Okay, not sure whether I see any of those, any questions. So hold on a little bit, so maybe you get to know. So this is now our master equation, right? And before we do anything, uh, we have all the electrons in the zero beam and we have none in the refracted beam. And uh, then we go into the above equation. We have two equations now, right? And if we have these two equations and we want to solve them, and so both of them have to be zero, then that means that uh, the determinant has to be zero, and we have an equation like this. So the diagonal ones are relatively benign and boring, and the non-diagonal elements of this set is the dynamic, uh, dynamic coupling. So that is what allows the uh, break reflections to change their intensity or yeah, actually, it's the amplitude. So we have uh, a, a solution for that. It's a quadratic term. So we have two solutions. And after some forming backwards and forwards, we have an S. This S is actually our excitation errors that we introduced. Uh, two lectures to so last Friday, uh, we have an extinction distance. And that is just the periodicity between uh, 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 changing the intensity from for the diffractive beam from having zero to having the full intensity here. Uh, we have Another substitution here is that is an effective excitation error. Uh, so it just makes, makes it writing uh, easier, but that is a, uh, something that is often used. So either this equation or that equation is what you will find uh, in the books on, on, on uh, BT theory, right? So, uh, If we uh, put our, our Bloch waves into that, okay, what's going on here? Then uh, and go through the uh, all the equations. And what we're interested in is for our uh, waves to find in our Bloch find the intensity. So this is the intensity, right? So we have a matrix multiplication. And uh, that is just, uh, we have two beams, so it's 100%. So the uh, zero beam is losing. Um, so the reflector beam is whatever we lost from our incoming beam. And we end up with an equation like this. We have an oscillation term here with sine square, right? It depends on our effective excitation error. So it is excitation error plus periodicity and uh, <clears throat> our uh, extinction distance. Uh, and here is the extinction distance. And this depends on the thickness. So it means that the intensity is varying. This is called the so-called pendel lösung. Uh, of, of two coupled oscillators. So in quantum mechanics, we have two 
uh, quantum oscillators that are coupled in uh, in mechanics you would have uh, two uh, pendula right you have a spring in between them and if the first one swings and you have a spring in between then the other one starts going but eventually only the second one that was initially uh, not uh, excited gets excited and the first one stands still so and these oscillations are the so-called rocking curves so if we put the same equation that we have here okay for the reflected beams here uh, yeah, here so that is exactly the same equation and we are trying to look at that we can just run that and we see the incident beam is losing energy uh, this is relative to the uh, extinction distance so here after that so it's of the periodicity are light before. Uh, uh, that is where it lost complete all the intensity, right? And the refractor beam has all of that. And then after another ex uh, extinction distance, it is exactly the opposite. This is the reason why we have um, contrast reversal in high resolution TEM. That's why we have in normal uh, images, we have thickness fringes, so we can estimate our thicknesses based on that. Even if we have several beams, that happens, of course, because what we did is we retract, uh, reduce the problem here. So that is what's happening here. If you are having A larger tilt from the well, we can reduce that, right? So what we're doing is at zero, you're not seeing much of a difference, but uh, 2.4. But if we use a much larger excitation error, tilting out of it, so we see we have many more oscillations. So the whole thing is oscillating just faster and faster. So depending on the mist tilt, you have have a change there. And uh, the dampening of the whole thing uh, is, is uh, okay, I did something stupid here. Let's go back to this and not introduce any kind of damping. Then of course the oscillations would go for, uh, on forever, which Obviously, they don't do. What are the stamping? What is the stamping? So it is mostly inelastic scattering. So, uh, and most of them are phonon scattering. Uh, the next one is the bark plasmon scattering. So the in uh, scattering that makes the beam not longer coherent and makes in our diffraction pattern actually uh, a kind of gray background that we were uh, looking for before. So coupled oscillators is what we have. So we separated everything out. And so we look at our uh, solutions now in terms of rack peaks or block waves. And uh, uh, we have some coupled. So that are the non-diagonal elements that uh, do the dynamic mixing for our refracted beams. And uh, we have to look a little bit more into that. Uh, one is actually something I was showing you earlier, or wanted to show you at least earlier, uh, and that is uh, the thickness determination. You can use this formula directly to use uh, the thickness uh, determination. So, you use a convergence angle that is relative. Where is this? Okay, here we are. So you want to have a convergence angle 
that you have very little overlap between the zero beam and the refracted beam. This is a profile through the uh, refracted beam in two beam conditions. And we saw that in seabed that as we go out from the perfect rack conditions, if we have two beam conditions, so the excitation error goes now in this direction only. So we can sum over excitation errors. So this is a list of excitation errors. Uh, again, we have an excitation error map here. And uh, these oscillations are exactly the oscillations that we had before. We are in two-beam conditions. We know what we're do doing. And by going back to our equation, we can plot one over the extinction distance with uh, uh, one over n k, which is uh, related to the uh, thickness. And so the slope gives us our extinction distance. And the extinction distance is a materials parameter. So we know what kind of density, or at least uh, relative density we have here, and uh, we get the thickness out of that as well. So we get both of that. There is one key element that we need to understand for STEM. And that is we have a quadratic equation for our Bloch waves. And uh, so we get two solutions for them, a cosine and a sine one. And uh, one of these solutions is on the atomic columns. And the other one is in between the atomic columns. Uh, so if you put your beam on top of an atom or in a channel, so in between, then what you're doing is you excite or uh, preferentially the one block wave or the other. And the different block waves have different uh, speeds inside the crystal. So the one on the atomic column get accelerated. Actually, uh, Harald Rose always uh, makes the, the uh, remarks that all of these atoms look like single uh, small little uh, lenses. So they will uh, converge the beam more onto the atomic column. And we have the other ones on, uh, in between. So you selectively, you select different block waves as you go through the crystal. Okay. And this block uh, BT theory is the basis for all of the uh, diffraction theory. So we went from. This is a state in quantum mechanics all the way to the solution of the Bloch waves here. Um, the key thing again is to remember it's uh, of course directly observable and uh, that these solutions are basically quantum mechanic uh, oscillator, coupled quantum mechanical oscillators, okay? So, now we want to do something with that, and we are not using the BT formalism. We are going to use uh, something closely related. That are the howe wieland equations. Okay, let's go over here. In lecture 10, we are going to use the multi-slice notebook. So what we want to do is we want to look in with a pair elimination can we recreate what we did here now? And where does the, do the different uh, things come in? Okay, so we open it in Colab. Should have done it right away so that we get a little bit ahead here. And we start downloading all the uh, missing packages. So, what we are going to do is we are going to go over the Howe Wieland equation, which is the basis for most of the different uh, packages to do image simulation. We are doing that 
so that we can uh, see the um, basis for all of that, and so that you can make intelligent choices of your parameters for the for the simulations, right? Uh, today we will use uh, ABTM. Very nice. It's a you can use it from the Jupyter notebooks, so that's why I'm using it, and it's uh, really very convenient. So we are over here with downloading. Good. Okay, didn't take long for me. Okay, so the multi slice algorithm of the Howey Wieland uh, equation. So we separate out our problem, but now not in terms of uh, quantum mechanical uh, differences, but we slice our crystals. Uh, and then we have. Within the slice, we have our potential where we have diffraction. And then after that, we come out with different angles. So we have different passes from one slice to the next, depending on what kind of angles we uh, introduced. So we have different phase shifts. Then that is now our incoming one again. And we go through that one by one. You can switch out some of them. So it gives you a lot of um, flexibility if you want to do that. You can go to, you can build relatively large models. Um, and uh, so what we need first is we have to build our, our slice. The slice is our projected potential and the atomic scattering factors are already tabulated, and I have them uh, tabulated from Kirkland. Uh, I used those, and uh, uh, so you can use it in, in PyTemLib. Uh, from the different atoms, we build our slice. From the slice, we do have to go from one to the next. So. Uh, uh, or first we have to go through that slice. So that is our transmission function from the potential to the transmission function. So that's where all the action happens. Then this is where we propagate from one slice to the next. And uh, we have to define the incident wave. In our case, it's first a plane wave. So we are just coming in straight in this one. And uh, then we go iteratively slowly through that whole thing. The projected potential, they are tabulated. They are tabulated for diffraction and we used that already. Um, and in Kirkland's book, you can get this uh, equation here, how you get the parametric, his parameterization into a potential. So that's copied one to one, more or less. There's a few changes only. And so we get now the potential. So in which angles are we scattering? Uh, we, we change it over to more useful uh, in, in, in one over nanometer or nanometer with our A. Then we do that over here. So the Rydberg constant is, of course, inside pi constants. And then I'll just do this uh, projected potential. It's kind of funny that uh, making the potential is actually not an insignificant amount of time. So here's a quarter of potential. I just plot it all over and make a full potential out of that. So it's integrated now over the C direction and it's a probability for how much an electron will scatter. So this is how the potential, the projected potential of, of a single atom looks for us, right? Uh, and we put that in a supercell. One atom is of course not quite enough. We'll put a whole bunch of them there and we have a projected potential of one single layer. 
and of course we just put that together in one function and that is what we're going to use uh, I want to calculate not silicon uh, it's actually is a bit uh, not as illustrative so we're going to do strontium titanate it's kind of the white mouse of, of stem uh, so we make and uh, I want to explain here how I'm using the the slices right so we have uh, our square unit cell, and we use uh, the top and the middle for the two different slices here. Uh, in silicon, you could compress the whole thing into uh, into one. Uh, so here we use single uh, two slices for a single unit cell, and the distances are of course half a unit cell apart and uh, and we order them and so we have two different slices and we make the two different slices uh, and that's how they look like right so one is the strontium with uh, oxygen and here's a titanium uh, oxygen and now we use the transmission function for all of them. The transmission function is uh, this is uh, T, and that is a projected potential. It's an uh, interaction parameter sigma that depends solemnly on your acceleration voltage, right? And uh, it's a uh, So here is your, your lambda relativistically corrected. So the crystal potential basically in it's uh, not surprisingly uh, periodic form. And uh, so this is our potential that we are getting them. So they are the phase shifts in the end of what's going on. And then we have a propagator. Propagator is relatively easy, right? So we know how far it is and for the different angles. So it should look a little bit like a Gaussian and that is the one. So we have it in uh, real and in reciprocal space, uh, imaginary part of, uh, so it's a complex function. The incident function is just once. Right, so all of them come in at the same time. So it's just a plain zero, uh, one uh, matrix of the same size as our um, supercell or our projected potential supercells or our slices. And what we do then is we go through that and once we are through our two different slices, we start from the beginning and use whatever comes out on the bottom in the top. So we do that iteratively. Um, and we do it as often as you want to. In our case, uh, I did it five times and we get our exit wave intensity. Um, it doesn't take too long, so it's very thin samples, right? So, but you see the uh, intensity of the exit wave changes uh, depending on the thickness. So the different block waves or the Bragg reflections in, within the uh, crystal are interacting and exchanging intensity. They have different phases from the different path lengths. And so they interfere in different different ways. In order to get from this exit wave to a diffraction pattern, we do the same thing that we did before with the Ronchigram. Uh, we use the exponential function and of 
this wave uh, with, uh, and uh, do a Fourier transform of that. Uh, so the diffraction pattern is then, uh, we have to shift it back so that zero is in the middle. Uh, we have Fourier, trans uh, Fourier transformation here. This is our exit wave, right? And one over uh, one J is, is a complex of that. So we do that and we get diffraction patterns. Ooh, okay. Let's zoom in a little bit. Maybe we get a bit better intensities. Okay. And so you see the Bragg peaks changed intensities. They did not change, of course, as we said before, their kinematic determined angle. So this Bragg peaks interact and we have these changes uh, depending on the thickness. So this is the multi-slice algorithm. So there's not really uh, that much mathematically done to it because you, uh, you know, changed it into an iterative process. Let's go and do the same thing for the converging beam electron diffraction. And that would be if you put your beam on in stem mode at a certain position. So we open it in Colab. Right. Here we are. Um, and we do exactly the same thing as we did before. So what is the difference? The difference is that we are not coming in with a single plane wave anymore, but with uh, a convergent, uh, with, with many different uh, angles, depending on our convergence. Mm -hmm. okay. And we download all the different packages, we do the same thing as we did before, right? So we do a, we slice our, uh, our strontium titanate, same thing as before. So we have our strontium here, titanium oxygen here. There's an, uh, strontium, there's an oxygen here in the center, of course. But shouldn't forget those. So we do exactly the same we did before. We have the same transmission function. Nothing changes, right? Uh, our acceleration function, we use 60 kV, just so that we have that. And propagator in between the slices. Same thing as before, right? So angle dependence of the, of the path lengths. And now we have the incident beam. And the incident beam, we go back to what we did to the probe shape. In, uh, in our case, a perfect uh, probe shape will be done if you have uh, aperture coherently illuminated. So, what we're doing is we use an, an aperture function here, and we are just illuminated coherently. Uh, and what we get is the airy disk function that we had before, right? And this is our starting point. So it means depending on your Aberrations, you can put any kind of probe functions in there, right? So all we need is say uh, aberrations or probe functions here. So this is defined in the reciprocal space already. So uh, 
We're good. And now we let set one run. So we do the same thing as we did before. And we have an exit wave here. Okay, not very visible. Let's look at that. It's a very thin sample here. So we did not get a lot of uh, intensity out into the uh, refracted beams here. We calculate the diffraction pattern. So nothing changes, of course. So we're just in real space here. Now we go into uh, reciprocal space for our diffraction pattern. And we calculated for two different thicknesses here. And we get the simulated diffraction patterns of Swanston titanate. Let's look here. What we are supposed to be looking for is, okay. So first, this one is a very thin sample. This is a thicker one. We know we have excitation error changes here. And in this case, we see already our thickness fringes that we should be seeing based on, say, uh, rocking curves, right? So the pendulum of our oscillators, dynamic coupling of our oscillators. So we have set here. So we looked at this center part. We learned about that last time. What we do is we look at the center part and we look at the outer part. So here, nothing much is changing, right? So that looks like there's not much more uh, information in here. Here we have very clearly something square. So that's uh, consistent with our uh, strontium titanate. If we look at the outer ones, we also see that we have uh, 4 mm uh, symmetry here, and we have the 4 mm symmetry here in our diffracted beams as well. So if you have a polar sample or something else, that would not be the case here, right? Even so, the, um, even if the um, unit cell is, is square, right? So you would have a change in the pattern uh, that is depending on your excitation errors. So very clearly, we got already a step closer here to looking at our uh, 4D stem data. So the next thing you would have to do is make the excitation uh, this a bit larger so that the disks are overlapping. Uh, we see that we have some forbidden reflections that we get dynamically activated here. Uh, so it's completely consistent with uh, what we would expect. But if we really look back into this uh, diffraction pattern, you will never see anything like that. So something is not quite right. So we have the right symmetry. We have done everything more or less correctly, but it's not quite right. So we'll have to do a little bit more. Uh, one caution, say starting and end point here have the same number of pixels because we do just Fourier transformation and so on. So, and they are related, right? So you have here, uh, depending on uh, what kind of uh, field of view you have, you have a resolution in reciprocal space and vice versa. So the real space and reciprocal space are directly related. And so we have to take care of that. So you cannot do everything on a single unit cell because otherwise you're not getting uh, 
the resolution in the reciprocal space, vice, vice versa. So it has to be a certain size that, that you do in your, um, your simulation on, otherwise you're not having enough uh, break reflections that can be possibly in there. So you're restricting it in the reciprocal space. Um, so you check the pixel size and see whether it's uh, <clears throat> converging to whatever you're doing. Uh, is, so we can get all the dynamic diffraction that we are having. Uh, we get very reasonable results here. Uh, and you can do that, of course, a bit faster, larger, with, with more sophisticated ones. So this one is really directly from the textbook into matrix algorithms and calculating it. And you see, it's already working quite, uh, quite well, but this is not a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. So what is missing? And what's missing is the thermal diffuse part of that. So we are having a very, very large contribution from phonon scattering. So you're not, well, even that wouldn't help you if you go to zero Kelvin, because you have your zero Kelvin uh, wiggling of the atoms because they cannot uh, stand still, right? And I'm starting already here my, Okay, must have done something before so that it doesn't get on here. So that's quite fast, much faster than what, what you are getting. So you might be now behind. Uh, okay, so what we are using is, uh, and I didn't, uh, explain that before. For the crystals, we are using the, ASE atomic simulation environment. Uh, this ASE is fabulous. We re I really thank the uh, ones who uh, maintain that. Uh, and we have changed the pycroscopy packages over to have all the structures done with the ASE. Once you have your structure in ASE, then you can do all the general crystallography with it but you can also do MD calculations. You can do density functional theory, in GW, whatever. It's, uh, it's great. So they will translate it for you for the right input for all different kind of EFT programs, MD programs. Um, but also it will allow you to do the ABTM here, our image simulation. And so we need to speed up everything a little bit. And so did it run? No. What's going on? Okay. We define our strontium titanate here. Uh, we can do that in many different ways. Uh, if you go to the ASE website, so you can get one for carbon nanotubes, any 2D material, all of these things would work. And we define our structure here. Uh, ooh, the way this is, is uh, changed here is if you put it to the side, okay. And then you can see that you're lowering that. It's a bit tricky. So what we are having is a really long stack of stones and titanates. So that's what we want to uh, look at. Morning. Yeah. 
Uh, in ASE, so in ABTM, everything is in angstrom. So be careful about that. So we have most, most of the time our uh, images in uh, nanometer units. So we have that. And uh, so this is how we are looking at strontium titanate. So we made here uh, a size eight times eight times 80. So relatively thick and relatively wide, not just four by four. So this is what we are using to, and our field of view is about 30 uh, angstrom, three nanometer. Then the same thing as what we did, we have a parameterization of the different uh, uh, atomic form factors. So the scattering probability of the single atoms. So they make a potential out of that. It's relatively quick. And then we make an exit wave. Potential building took a while, uh, 10 seconds. And we go through the different slices here in another 10 seconds. And then we plot the diffraction pattern. And the diffraction pattern should be the same thing that we got before, right? So nothing is really changed. So our incoming beam was apparently plane wave and with the different intensities in the diffraction pattern. Again, we notice the reflections here that are forbidden reflections that we got. But now we have to introduce the thermal diffuse scattering. So the atoms are not sitting smack in their perfect positions. They always uh, move around and about. So there is a certain amount of phonons that are happening. And the way we are using doing that is with the so-called frozen phonon approximation. Mm -hmm. So what it is, we rattle the atoms a little bit. And we do that depending on the de Barbella factor. That gives us how much, say, uh, or deviate from, from its perfect positions. And we do that randomly. Uh, in this case, I will just add 12 of them up. So it means we have, instead of having one calculation, now we have to have 12 ones. And 12 independent ones, obviously that could be very nicely uh, farmed out to 12 different processors. Even that one could be multiplied out. Uh, so Fourier transformation, all of that is nicely parallelizable. And so we go from something that looks like this to a thermal ensemble. And the thermal ensemble now has this, uh, depending on, on the de Barbella factor, has um, the single atom positions randomly uh, deviation, uh, random deviation from them. So what does that do? That is the key thing here, right? Uh, we build a potential, we do that from like before. And this takes about five minutes now, should have stopped. Uh, build a potential, we run through one multi-slice, here. Yeah. And again, this could have been done in parallel, but but not on Google Colab, so you would have, have to work on that. Uh, so we do the perfect one, and then we do a lot of them where we have same, the atoms rattle around in the belt. Once we have done that, 
we take the exit waves of them, so that is amplitude and phase, and make a diffraction pattern from that. That is uh, basically the same thing as we did before. And depending on what your convergence angle is, this is your experimental conditions. Uh, this method will allow to use uh, this allows the interaction between the different uh, beams. So obviously when the uh, different uh, disks overlap, you have uh, any kind of interference patterns uh, from that. So all of that is there. The interference pattern, however, is perfect, right? So we have no instabilities or uh, any other changes of the coherence of our of our incoming probe. Again, they can be introduced by the appropriate uh, beam profile. Okay, so we are about halfway through, so we take another two minutes here. Maybe it gives you time to catch up on that while we are waiting for this. We are actually a little bit ahead of time here. I thought it would take us longer. Uh, if we look here into the frozen phonon thing, uh, so we have a seed, so we can use different seeds for the random distribution of that. Uh, 12 seemed to be an okay amount. Uh, the order of magnitude for that, maybe we should look at that. So it's about uh, 10 picometers at this atoms rattle around and about at room temperature. If you go to liquid nitrogen temperature, um, it will reduce the thermal diffuse scattering obviously, uh, but it's not, uh, people normally do not consider it worthwhile to go through the trouble to cool it down uh, because um, the effect is not really tremendous. So here we are now running second to the last one. Now here is the last one. Okay, so we did that. We have our multi slice one, we average. I hope not to run that again. Ooh, otherwise, we stand here and we get the changes that we have from a single configuration, which is already rattled, to a bigger one. So it's not really perfectly symmetric anymore. And the diffraction pattern for the two different waves are very clear. So we had the symmetric ensemble. I'm zooming in here. The thickness is about the same. So with the interaction parameter didn't change too much between the symmetric ensemble and the single thermal ensemble, but we have uh, some changes here, but it's more interesting to look back into what we, okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> okay, that wasn't super good. So if we look for the symmetric ensemble, we don't see any kind of Kikuchi lines, but we know from thicker samples in uh, the TM that we should see the Kikuchi lines and with a little bit of wiggling, we already see them and they get
more pronounced as we uh, add the different um, rattled uh, ensembles uh, together. So this looks now, this look is an ideal uh, diffraction pattern. This looks like a uh, selected area electron diffraction pattern as we would expect it from the TEM. So all the information is here now. We do the same thing again, but now for the convergent beam pattern. And there the changes will be a little bit more pronounced. We use a pixelated detector, so it means we get all the different things here. Again, potential with this lies. And uh, this is our perfect ensemble. We see the old strings. We see our intensities in the center. So everything's here. And now we do the thermal diffuse scattering on that. Uh, again, we do the same calculation as we did before. The so calculation takes exactly the same amount of time. So we have four minutes here where we are waiting on. Uh, and we can think about what we expect. So we have some amount of intensity that get scattered out to high angles. That's important for C contrast emitting, right? We want to know what the intensity is at higher angles. And so we have this thermal diffuse scattering that produces that. The thermal diffuse scattering is an incoherent scattering. So that is the main contribution to our C contrast image. So that's really what we need to be doing. Without that, you're missing. Uh, the, the, the quantitative part of that. Um, so, and you can see it even at this magnification that there is not much out here and you get a uh, kind of intensity out to higher angles. Question is, where is your detector? That's something we're gonna have to figure out as we go along. The same thing here in convergent beam electron diffraction. Here we have the Holtz rings very, very dominant and prominent. Uh, and we saw that in the diffraction simulation where we use pure kinematic ones uh, as well. Uh, that they show up very, very nicely. But uh, again, this is not what you would see in a TEM. The, fraction pattern looks different. And that's what we are exploring here with the thermal diffuse scattering. Um, again, four minutes. So it doesn't really make a difference whether you come in with uh, plane wave, convergent probe, an aberration probe. It does not make any difference because it's semantics multiplications as we saw for the uh, transmission function and the uh, projector. So just matrices that get convoluted in real space or reciprocal space. So you have a lot of Fourier transformation going backwards and forward. And so that is where most of the uh, speed up comes from. Fast Fourier transformations um, is, is a key here and uh, parallelization. 
to wait here another 30 seconds. As always, the slices and the multi slice, uh, the potential and the multi slice have about the same time. So that could be speed up a bit. Okay, one more. Okay, aligned. <laughs> Um, so the seabed here, and then we go and look at the comparison for our different diffraction patterns. And you can see now what a fundamental difference you have between a symmetric ensemble and a thermal ensemble especially if you think you want to collect anything out here in this part. Most of the intensity here is due to rack reflections to high angles. This is still there. So we still have our, our, our hold rings here, especially if we get a little bit sicker, we get, get them back. Uh, but that would mean this is coherent. So that's purely kinematic reflections. So it's not any kind of incoherent uh, intensity here. While if we look at the uh, thermal ensemble, we only have thermal diffuse scattering and we have very little contribution from the kinematic part. And that is the beauty and, 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 and strengths of the sea contrast images that you now can use the thermal diffuse scattering for your imaging and for uh, uh, looking at your, your samples. And key thing, however, is then that uh, you take uh, care of that. Okay. Again, this is what, if you hold the beam somewhere, you will get. Uh, and so what do we have to uh, take care of? We have to take care of the uh, enough um, uh, or calculations for the thermal assemble so that we get an average. So we are here on the on the lower limit, obviously. I wanted to do it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, unfortunately, we cannot uh, paralyze it more. Uh, uh, the key ingredient for the Howe Wieland equation is that we treat each slice like a weak face object. So uh, the only thing that changes within the slice is um, the face of, of the uh, incoming uh, probe or wave or wave assembly. So uh, that is of course okay since it is extremely thin. So. You cannot make this too thick or the weak phase object approximation will not longer hold. So that gives you a limitation of how thick your, your slice can be within the crystal. So you cannot just say uh, 50 nanometer of strontium titanate, 50 nanometer of strontium titanate, and that's it. That's not gonna work because the weak phase object approximation would be failing. If your atoms are very thick, uh, some people actually think about how to uh, slice the different uh, atom potentials. So let's look uranium oxide or something. Then you would slice your uranium atom actually in, um, put the uranium atoms in different slices and projects in there. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's possible. Uh, and you need to do this Similar diffuse scattering. <laughs> uh, um, how 
can you improve the red link? Um, so you can do that in, in many different ways. So I did it just more or less randomly. And I said, this is how much it has to change backwards and forward. However, you can do a real phonon distribution calculation in density functional theory. You can do an MD calculation and take different steps. That is what a lot of people are doing. So different time steps, you use your ensemble of the atoms. Uh, you use the correct one on distribution for your uh, material. That improves thing on very, very small details. So for machine learning, it's probably overkill because uh, you want to generate a lot of, of, of uh, data fast. So this is the fastest way you can do that. Uh, and you can analyze and afterwards exactly the intensity. So that is bringing me back to the key point of the thermal diffuse scattering. This is where we get the exact intensity distribution within your image. This is where we get the <clears throat> 4D stem data that we simulate, right? So we have a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern here that uh, we get for each different position. And that is what we do in the last of our uh, notebooks. So we go back to our machine learning GitHub page, lecture 10, that's where we are. We go to the C contrast simulation and we open it in Colab. Run it anyway. I see. So apparently, <clears throat> my trying out uh, the notebooks was uh, saving me the downloading of all the different uh, packages. Uh, again, we use the uh, ABTM, and uh, I, for your convenience, put the uh, uh, it's a reference for you there that, that you can cite if you use it for your research. Uh, having it in a Python applicable part, you can use it. While we are waiting for that, oh no, we're done. I have a few things to say about things. Okay. So now we load all the different ones. Okay. So going a few steps back, maybe you missed the imaging part. So what do we do in C contrast imaging or in STEM scanning transmission electron microscope? We converge our beam to a very small spot and then we scan it in a usually rectangular uh, pattern. Uh, top left and we go down. So you get a matrix of different pixels. And the uh, detector gets a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. And in 4D STEM, you acquire that or parts of that. And sometimes you acquire the uh, inner part of your convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. This a uh, fast camera, obviously, and the high angular dark field part with uh, HADF, high angle angular dark field detector, which is a ring detector, and that sums just over all the uh, intensities that go to high angles. Um, and so we went just over the thermal diffuse scattering and so that that is really what governs how the intensity in a conversion beam pattern at high angle is, is determined. 
it did not do anything to the symmetry, but it changed the intensity of the different features. Again, we make our structure with the frozen phonons that we talked about just a second ago. So we have a potential frozen phonon approximation. Again, I use only 12 different thermal ensembles or rattled ensembles, rattled uh, parts. So each single layer is, is rattled against, against each other, right? And so we make our probe. I'm using now a larger one than I had before. So I use 20 milli radians. Uh, and at 80 kV, that means that the disks are overlapping. If you want to do high resolution stem, then the disks have to overlap. So this overlapping will give you say high resolution. If you don't have it overlapping, just touching, then you get very good uh, diffraction information, but what you're not getting is a good resolution. So you're limited to half a nanometer or something like that. Uh, while you get down to 50 picometer or less nowadays with an aberration corrected microscope. So we determine the detector and <clears throat> we do our convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. Now with the larger angles, right? Because that's what we need for an atomic resolution C contrast image. And we want to see how that changes things. Again, it takes about just a little bit faster. I'm not sure. I got a better computer now from Google. So it takes about two minutes here, one and a half. And uh, Um, the other key ingredient is a different angle. So we have uh, ring detectors. We have the camera. We also have segmented detectors. So that is segments of a ring. Uh, we use that for differential phase contrast imaging. Again, it's a very good idea to look at what your bulk material should look like in these kind of uh, detectors, and you should do your diligence here. Uh, it will take just to make a new uh, crystal, even if you haven't done it ever with ASE, less than half an hour to do that. So we calculate our convergent beam pattern. does not show. Funny, okay. So should show it here, okay. So we define two detectors that we want to integrate over, a bright field detector in the middle and a high angle dark field detector. We can do medium angle detectors here. We can do uh, just a segment, quarter, four different quarters of that so we can define whatever we want. Uh, and on the ABTMs, I will show you how to do that uh, in, in detail, right? So we now uh, want to, yeah, too bad that we don't see that. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. So uh, the next part is we want to scan the probe all over the place. Uh, for that, we make a data directory. We see here now we I made an ABTM uh, directory. Uh, and now I want to define what kind of area do I want to scan. So for this seabed 
over here. For the uh, seabed calculation, I need a relatively large supercell, but it's just repeated in all different directions. I don't want it. So I just need to place my atoms at different positions here. And before that, we only had it at zero, zero. Now we have it all over the place and we move that around and we want to see what does change. Okay, I must not have done. Okay, I didn't run this one here, I think. So we're defining this area. So this is the area I'm scanning and I need all the rest of that to have uh, the correct field of view, to have the sort of correct resolution in, the, in my uh, uh, conversion beam pattern, so my 40 stem data, right? So as before, I do uh, a potential, and this takes about 20 minutes uh, on my laptop. If we wait for the first scan here. So we scan for the different areas. So how much do we scan? Let's look. So we make a grid scan and we go up to the Lindquist function, the probe. Uh, we use an inner angle of 90 and 190 and zero to 20 for the bright field. So 20 was our convergent beam, uh, well, our convergence angle for, for the beam, right? And uh, say, Distance here gives us how many pixels we have, right? Because we have so and so many pixels for the area. So we're scanning still. That's a bit slow here. Okay. So we have about 17 minutes now for us to wait what's going on. Um, just remember that I wanted to say something. Okay. Yeah, I really wanted to compare. This user changes that is happening when we have different convergence angles here. Oh, we already have here 20 milliradians. So this one already. Uh, while I'm playing around, I was doing that probably. So if you look how the disks are overlapping, we are not really having the resolution to seeing that in both of them. So uh, both of this, uh, <clears throat> uh, pattern would need much higher resolution if you want to use 4D stem data. It means that your, your supercell must be much larger or you're not going to uh, to see that, right? Uh, if you integrate over things on different parts anyway, that might be enough. So it's this specific position. We actually have uh, a change in our symmetry here and we have high intensity left, right versus uh, uh, top, right, bottom, left, and compared to the other diagonal, right? So this is local dependence, and that is what you expect. If we go back to non-overlapping one, we get real diffraction data, while this one here is now much more localized, and you see where you are within your sample. So this is not an artifact, that is what we actually are going to use in order to get our uh, image. 
and so it is what you're going to use in order to select or, or interpret your 4D stem data. Um, if <clears throat> we have a detector here that has a segment over here versus over here, then obviously you would see this change. Uh, and so it would mean that you see the potential of the atomic column you're going through. So that is exactly what, what you need and want. The 4D stem data are still going. So completely dependent on the information you want to see. Uh, you have to select the real space data and the number of pixels. So if you increase the number of pixels, <clears throat> the Nimquist function changes and uh, goes up and down. So we have another 13 minutes that we can uh, kill. Uh, not having a lot of things to say anymore till we are finished here. Um, if uh, here we have a very uh, simple probe, uh, the probe to be really done would be for where it gets interesting is when you have an aberration corrected microscope. So then your spherical aberration would be much smaller. So this is a high resolution probe piece. So that without aberration correctors, that is as good as it gets, right? Uh, we have the calculated um, shades of focus here. And uh, unfortunately different from, uh, from the pi tem lib. Uh, this is a negative, it's an under focus, but it's positive. So I, I did it the other way around. Um, convergence angles are then up to 30 and 40 milliradians that you would use. <clears throat> and acceleration voltages uh, on a modern temp stem, you can go from 30 to uh, 200 or 300 kV, the higher the acceleration voltage, the better your resolution will be, as we saw in the uh, operation part of that and the, the probe part. So the probe will be directly calculated as we did before. So excellent idea. If you're on your electron microscope or if people uh, giving you uh, data, tell them, I want to know all your aberrations when it comes to an aberration corrected microscope, because then you can use the probe that you actually have. Uh, what this calculation does is actually it gives you the amount in electrons or in uh, scattering probability actually. So depending on the <clears throat> intensity, uh, you can calculate back on the uh, on the noise that you have. So that would be uh, certainly an improvement and it will get you a better idea of where this is. Another very common problem with uh, these kind of data is that people do not give you uh, any information of what the zero level is. So if you do take your C contrast images, get one where you blank the beam, go through a, a vacuum or whatever, so that you have a zero level for the um, for your detector. It's very important. I want to add something to the ABTM, why they are uh, a bit unique with things. Uh, and that is, you can actually <coughs> use 
say, potential from a DFT calculation. So you can go into the GPAR um, um, program that so does density functional theory. You calculate your um, material and say, Convergent beam electron diffraction is actually sensitive enough to the electron distribution. And so also CBET is converged, also CBET is con uh, sensitive. And so the C contrast image is sensitive to that uh, uh, electron distribution. So you can use a fully converged uh, potential or so with the cores and say valence electrons redistributed, you can use it <clears throat> and calculate your convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. You can do it before and after you uh, Converged them. And so the idea is you can look at the influence that has and see whether for your specific problem it is important. Well, in bulk, most of the time not, if you're very cool. Uh, new material with whatever density waves, uh, spin waves, whatever, it might be useful to see is it detectable or not. But in uh, areas where charge transfer might occur, like interfaces, green boundaries, defects. Uh, that's where uh, this is uh, certainly coming in handy. And uh, this is a specific program, say ABTM allows you to do that. And it's completely integrated. You can do it in a notebook like this one and you straightforward with that. Okay. Let's look now where we are with our calculation. Um, <clears throat> another seven minutes. Let's see whether we have any questions in the chat. Go here. Mm -hmm. There's my chat. Doesn't look like there is anything in here. Everybody is already completely entranced with the uh, moving. Can I move to this one? Should have done this ahead of time. Okay. Here we are. Okay. I only get the zero peak. Mm. No. Um, you have to plot your image, your, your fully transformed image in a logarithmic scale or you don't see anything. Uh, Another reason could be that you have negative values in your image. Uh, that is also a, a problem. So in my notebooks, uh, I usually just uh, subtract the minimum. Uh, again, not very quantitative because what you really should make sure is that your minimum value is positive and at the level of the vacuum level. Uh, but if I don't know that, I put it down to zero. 
Uh, that are the two key things if you do Fourier transform. Uh, otherwise, it should work quite well. I would uh, advise you to do the power spectrum. Uh, that way you get gets it all directly, okay? It was not directly related to what we have here, but that is okay. If we have any other questions to me, now we have a chance. We have another four minutes so we can look at that. Okay. Nobody? Okay. So this uh, <clears throat> progress bars are quite useful here. As you see, we can see what's going on. Let's go back to where we need to be with uh, that. Um, and the thermal diffuse scattering, if you want to try, uh, play around with that, I would check it out. So go to something like eight nanometer, uh, eight milliradians of angle. And uh, if we do the convergent beam there, then we'll see that we have very different things. With eight milliradians, your probe diameter will be larger. Obviously, you're not longer selectively uh, activating one block wave uh, set versus the other, right? Okay, so you see I chose not too badly here. Let's see how much it overlaps. Ah, a little bit, you see that does have some changes already. Uh, the fourfold symmetry, however, is uh, preserved and it is preserved here already as well. So do the TDDS, just so that we have time so we can check it out. So different convergence angle will get you different <clears throat> resolution and different uh, information in the uh, 4D stem. So be aware of that. Again, for the ones where I was too fast, so I went back to the uh, notebook number three, and I was changing the convergence angle from 20 to nine. Should have done it a little bit smaller. Maybe you want to do that with seven. You can see it's a non-overlapping one. And uh, we were discussing the changes there already. So this one takes, independent of your probe, as I said, about four minutes, depends mostly on what Google Colab gives you. On the supercomputer center, it takes you about 20 seconds. Uh, but then I have 48 notes right so it's mostly probably transferring the data backwards and forwards. Here. We're looking into that one. So we have another minute here. Uh, while we're looking for it, if you're reviewing my notebooks, I'm trying to uh, follow the guide of clean code. Please, wherever I screw up and we have some uh, residual bad code, uh, let me know, right? Uh, this specific one here is getting you the clean code in Python. Uh, I'm trying to have, okay, good. Okay, we sit down here, we check our output. Anyway, so uh, what I'm trying to do is we have measurement files, right? So uh, obviously the people from ABTM trying to do that too, so probe, scan. So it's very self-explanatory what we're doing here. If there's a formula, I'm trying to do that one-to-one. -one. Um, that's the idea behind it. So 
we do our measurement. These are all the pixels that we calculated the convergent beam electron diffraction pattern from. Uh, we hit the titanium oxygen column over here, square and square in the middle. If we would have done it a little bit differently, we would have missed this point. Uh, and that is after 20. Yeah, 18 minutes of calculations, right? And we can plot the result a little bit better. So we have on the left, our high angle annular dark field, four hour specific detector settings for this idealized probe. Um, and now we can compare the intensities directly in, in that image. So here we have just this small part that we uh, calculated, just tiled the whole thing. This is a, a bright field image. Let's check whether we did that correctly. We zoom in and yeah, wherever there was an atom, right? So we have now negative one. We know with the Scherzer theorem, our atom should be dark and uh, we have our oxygens in this part here. Okay, so so it is all correct. Um, and so if you have 40 stem data, you can recreate that uh, and you can mess around much more with the different uh, data once you have them and you can do that after you have it acquired. So that's the idea behind it. Uh, we want to have a small probe as possible. So it means we want to have very large convergence angle. Things overlap. Uh, we have to fix our defocus. That is critical. Otherwise you are uh, activating more block waves than you think you are. Uh, we change the aperture according to what your largest coherent area is, which gets you back to the smallest probe size, right? And uh, the aberrations should be corrected. If, uh, if you can go to an aberration corrected microscopes. Uh, and uh, the better you tilt, the more easy it is to interpret your, your sample. You use a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern in your Uh, disk, you can do that with uh, milliradian positions, right? Uh, and the thinner your specimen is, the better will be your result. Except, of course, when you do diffraction, so for 40 stem, you need to be aware of that. And that is where, of course, simulation already takes an advantage or uh, gives you an advantage again because you can see in which kind of thickness ranges you should be. And uh, so key thing is dynamic scattering is important and we have to do that in thermal diffuse scattering. Thermal diffuse scattering, thermal diffuse scattering, blah, blah, blah. That was the key. Um, message of this lecture. And uh, with that in mind, uh, you now can generate data before you go on the microscope. Use your data to uh, interpret your intensities and you can generate large amounts of very or well, highly reliable uh, training data sets that you can then use for different and various purposes as you need them for your research. So thank you so much.
Let's see whether we have now some more questions. Okay. Wait a second till people wake up. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if that is all, thank you so much for uh, listening to this and viewing this lecture. Uh, and I wish you a lot of fun with the more advanced machine learning methods that you learn in the course of the uh, rest of the summer. Okay, bye-bye.